Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. Today we're going to be talking about the Arctic and specifically about the just concluded Arctic Council meetings. Our guests are Michaela Stiff, an Arctic policy analyst who serves as a program assistant with the Wilson Center's Polar Institute. She previously served as an associate at the Arctic Council Indigenous Peoples Secretariat. Also, Evan Bloom. Evan is a senior fellow with the Polar Institute. He's a former acting deputy assistant secretary for oceans and fisheries and director for ocean and polar affairs at the U.S. Department of State. In, 1966, in 1996, I should say, he helped establish the Arctic Council, negotiating its initial rules and documents. He then supervised U.S. representation in the council from 1996 to 2020. And David Balton is also a senior fellow with the Polar Institute and a former ambassador for oceans and fisheries at the State Department. During his US or during the US chairmanship of the Arctic Council from 2015 to 2017, Ambassador Balton served as chair of the senior Arctic officials. A big welcome to all of you for joining us. Thanks for being here. Thank you, John. So I, I know you've been busy, even though you're, you're not in Reykjavik, Iceland, where the meetings took place, you've been monitoring the goings on and it just concluded on the day that we're recording this discussion. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna start with something that Michaela, you had the, uh, the honor of being a narrator for a video that appeared on the website of the Arctic Council, a mini documentary that I would recommend to our viewers that you can find at the Arctic Council website. And we'll put the link in the metadata underneath this, this program so people can find it more easily. You begin your narration with a question, what comes to your mind when you think about the Arctic? And so I wanna pose that question to the three of you, a little gimmicky, forgive me for it, but I wanna flip it and not what comes to mind for you as experts on the Arctic, but when you get in the heads of others and when you think about how people think about the Arctic, uh, what do you think comes to mind? Michaela, let's start with you. Sure. I'm a lifelong Alaskan. I'm from Anchorage, Alaska, which technically isn't part of the Arctic when you look at the Arctic Circle map, though it might be considered part of the Arctic when you look at a United States map. And when I think of the Arctic, I really do, you'll see in the video, um, think of it as a home. There are 4 million people who live in the Arctic, one eighth of which are indigenous peoples. And there are many people that I notice when I've traveled outside of Alaska think of the Arctic as this icy, barren wasteland without people. And in fact, when you consider how many people that there are, the vast number of cultures that there are in the Arctic and the many different languages that are spoken, it's a very unique place. And it's a place that has a lot of history and culture. And so um, many of the issues talked about in the Arctic Council are very personal to people um, who are participating in it and who have stakes in the matter. Thanks, e Evan, your, your thoughts on our word association game. Sure, well, I mean, the local and, and indigenous communities, I mean, that's key to the entire region. It's a huge region um, extending uh, across from Russia to Greenland to Alaska. Um, that Americans don't tend to know uh, at least an, enough about. Um, but there's a lot going on up there. And as climate change has an effect, it, it's warming uh, three times uh, the amount as, as in other places in the globe. So there's a lot of change going on in the Arctic. And so uh, that's affecting the local communities and the, the eight Arctic states. David, your thoughts? The Arctic is a place of uh, growing geopolitical importance. The warming of the Arctic has made the region more accessible. Uh, there's a lot of different types of uh, human activities that are increasing in the Arctic. And this is, you know, both, this is the, the good side of the bad news story that is climate change for the Arctic. Uh, and with that increased human activity comes the need to manage that human activity. And that is what groups like the Arctic Council are striving to do. Uh, there's also been some increased geopolitical tension in the Arctic, uh, partly as a result of its warming up, uh, and we need to manage that as well. Evan, speaking of the council, you were there at the founding, you know, yeah. played a major role in the founding. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with the Arctic Council, can you tell us about the original conception and how it came to be? Sure. Back in the mid-90s, there really wasn't a lot of Arctic diplomacy. There was an understanding that the region was there and the State Department and other agencies in the U.S. did pay some attention to it, but it was uh, kind of a, a secondary consideration. And then the Canadians came forward with a proposal 
to take what was uh, called the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy a uh, group of, of uh, initiatives under Finland and that had been worked on with the US and some others and to transform it into the Arctic Council. Their particular idea was to benefit the Inuit communities in the Canadian North, um, but the idea was to bring together the eight states with territory uh, above the Arctic Circle to focus on sustainable development and uh, environmental protection. And it started out rather small. Um, it was meeting in, in local high schools in northern communities and um, in their two, uh, every two years of their biennial meetings. But somehow it caught the imagination of the Ar Arctic states and, and of the rest of the world. And as the sense of the melting of the ice seemed to open up the possibility for shipping and more economic activity, this became the most important um, diplomatic forum for, for the region. And so it built and built to the point that all of the uh, foreign ministers the for and foreign secretaries of these governments show up every two years. And it's a place where non-Arctic states want to come and understand what's going on um, so there's been this um, evolution of the council from a somewhat smaller uh, body to something that's taken on a lot of importance. David, let me ask you about uh, the evolution of the agenda for the council from your time directly involved to today, uh, the just concluded meetings. Has it been a, a case of staying the course or, or has because of new sea lanes and all the, the changes to the, to the actual planet, has the, has the agenda evolved? The agenda certainly evolved and the council along with it. Uh, the council today, as Evan was suggesting, uh, operates in ways that its founders probably did not anticipate, might, may not even have been able to imagine. Um, the focus is still on environmental protection and sustainable development, but the council has also gotten into some other topics in part, as you say, because the Arctic itself is changing so much. So the council has provided a venue for the negotiation of three binding agreements, treaties among the Arctic states that certainly wasn't part of the initial conception. One was on search and rescue. Why? Because there are more search and rescue incidents in the Arctic today. One was on marine oil pollution. Why? Because there's more shipping in the Arctic today. And one was on enhancing scientific cooperation. Why? Because the states realize they need to understand this region better. Yeah, the Arctic Council has definitely um, grown, evolved, strengthened. It now has a long-term strategic plan. Uh, it doesn't have, it's not without its problems, but it's still um, uh, uh, a necessary and uh, vital, vital form. Michaela, you, you were involved in the indigenous peoples movement within the council and the youth movement. And it's unique in that regard in that this isn't just window dressing. There's a real involvement of the two groups that I just mentioned. Can you talk to us a, a bit about that? And then also, do a plug for the, the uh, Polar Institute's Youth Symposium that just concluded last week. Yes, definitely. So the Arctic Council has six permanent participant organizations, which is the indigenous organizations with the status of being involved in all levels of the Arctic Council's work from research to diplomatic, um, like the ministerial that you see today. And uh, in fact, they're all um, very different organizations with different ideas and objectives for how to cooperate within the Arctic Council. Sometimes they'll come together and make joint declarations, including in 2019, there was the Arctic Year Summit in Rovaniemi, Finland. And that was the sixth time that they had all gathered together to create a joint declaration. But what's interesting is that it was the very first time that they've had a youth leader summit alongside um, the gathering of the six indigenous organizations, which by the way, are the Arctic Athabascan Council, the Aleut International Association, the Russian Association of the Indigenous Peoples of the North, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, the Sami Council, and the Gwich'in Council International. And um, while the permanent participants have been along actually um, some of them have been around since before the Arctic Council because their first joint meeting was in 1991, five years before it was formed. Um, having youth around is fairly new and actually in the Reykjavik Declaration, they mentioned for the first time the inclusion of youth. 
um, recognizing the importance of engaging Arctic youth in international cooperation. So it was really exciting to have at the Polar Institute a first annual Arctic Youth Symposium called the Arctic in 25 Years. You know, as we're looking back on the past 25 years of cooperation, it's really important that we look forward to the next 25 years, considering the drastic rate of change in the Arctic and knowing that young people will be the ones who are bearing the brunt of those changes. I've, I've asked um, your colleague, Mike Spraga, this more than once. And then the, 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 the question is essentially, we, we pay a lot of attention. The Wilson Center pays a lot of attention to the Arctic. And certainly, the, depending on geography, there are certain nations that do. Is, has this reached that tipping point yet where this is a focus globally? I would say question. yes, and I think that attention, John, is driven largely by the warming climate. And the Arctic Council is in part responsible for that. Uh, many years ago, the Arctic Council produced the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment that thought of, I think was the first time the world started paying attention to the fact of Arctic climate change, just how dramatic and potentially dangerous it is. And since then, um, the, uh, the, the Paris Agreement framework, the UNFCCC framework have uh, devoted more and more attention to the Arctic and nations are waking up to, to this, uh, both for good reasons, like we need to do more to deal with the climate crisis, but also for some questionable reasons, like a desire perhaps to um, exploit more fossil fuels in the Arctic or um, uh, otherwise contribute to the, the climate problem. But yes, I think, I think we have reached possibly even past the tipping point of attention at this point. The other, um... The other thing that often comes up is it, it, the way that the Arctic is almost a model for cooperation. That's certainly been represented by the comments that each of you made today. Why does it continue to somehow be able to operate in a way that is different from, say, U.S.-Russia relations when it relates to Ukraine or when it relates to election meddling? U.S.-Russia relations in the Arctic have actually been very positive. What makes this unique? So my, I'm sure all my colleagues have some thoughts on that, but um, let me give it a go. Um, somehow the Arctic Council seems to have found the sweet spot for uh, being able to provide a safe space for um, discussions between the US, its allies and Russia. Part of that is environment and sustainable development may be areas where that conversation can go on without a lot of uh, tension. But also it's because when the council was set up, it was deliberately set up as a non-regulatory body. It was not going to be an international organization and still isn't. Um, and it focuses on consensus-based discussions. So it isn't a place where you go for hard negotiation of shipping rules. Um, it isn't a place where you go for military dis security discussions at all. And in the original Ottawa Declaration, um, it says we're not going to talk about uh, military security issues. So at least the, the attitude of uh, Russia and the U.S. and the six other Arctic states has been um, we're going to try to cooperate here and a willingness not to bring other kind of more difficult international tensions into, into that body. Michaela and David, I want to get your thoughts on this, but before I do, I want to follow up on the last thing you said, Evan, about military not on the table. Can that continue in a realistic manner when we've seen uh, R Russian base building in, in the Arctic? Is that something that the Arctic Council will continue to be able to avoid? I think well, it's interesting. Council will continue to avoid the issue, but the question you raised begs another one. If it's not the Arctic Council that provides a forum to discuss these sorts of things, can we take those issues somewhere else? Today at the press conference following the Arctic Council Ministerial, the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, called again for renewal of a different forum, uh, the uh, Chiefs of Defense of the Arctic States, uh, to start meetings to talk about some of these issues. Those talks were suspended after the invasion of Ukraine and at least as of today have not resumed, but it is a fascinating question. Do we need some place to reduce the risk of even unintended conflict in the Arctic? I think the answer is yes. Kayla, your thoughts on, on the unique nature of the council and how it has managed to be a forum that represents cooperation versus competition or conflict. 
Yeah, I think that Evan started really well by talking about that this is a place for consensus and that that's how decisions are made. And in fact, I've heard from some of the original people who were around um, when the Arctic Council was founded, that it was actually the idea for consensus came out of the consultations with indigenous peoples within Canada, because that's how indigenous peoples, uh, many different indigenous peoples have made decisions. And consensus allows for people to come to a common understanding um, and simply just having the permanent participants working within the Arctic Council means that the Arctic Council's work is grounded in the Arctic and what people uh, is really in, um, important to people in the Arctic. So, you know, issues of environmental protection and sustainable development are the ones that come to mind there. How has the U.S. role changed with the change from the Trump administration to the Biden administration? I know Secretary Blinken was in Reykjavik for the meetings. Uh, is, is it a much more uh, sort of what's the word I'm looking for? I think uh, more more of, a, of agreement between the parties than there was during the Trump years where they seem to be out of step with several of the other countries. I guess I can speak to that because I was president. I was president present at the last uh, ministerial, um, and uh, at that point, Secretary Pompeo was leading a very different kind of approach. Um, the U.S. wasn't willing to say a whole lot about um, uh, climate change in the basic documents, and indeed opposed having a declaration at all. Uh, there was uh, a push against multilateral cooperation in general. And so the feeling at the ministerial, I think, was, was quite different from what we at least saw on the screen today. And we've come back towards the norm of the council, which is a willingness of all eight to cooperate, not to agree on, on everything. And to recognize any number of tensions that exist as between US and Russia in particular, and perhaps with uh, China and other observers who, who enter into the picture in, in some respects. Um, but I think we're returning to a sense of normalcy uh, with the Biden administration. And you mentioned Secretary Pompeo, he invoked the South China Sea as a potential peek into the future of what could happen in the Arctic. Is, is that a serious concern? We, we think of the South China Sea as a potential tinderbox, not as a model for cooperation. Uh, that's right, John. But the situations of the Arctic and the South China Sea are, in fact, quite different. In the South China Sea, there are many islands and other land features that are whose so the sovereignty of which is disputed among many countries. That is not true in the Arctic. Every point of land above water is known to belong and recognized to belong to one country and one country only. Um, there are still some serious questions about uh, the right of non-Russian vessels to sail through the Northern Sea Route across the top of Russia, and Secretary Pompeo was pointing to that and pointing to um, the fact that Russia was rebuilding its military install installations and capacities uh, in, the, in the far north as, a, as something to be wary of. He was not entirely wrong, but he was wrong the following day after that, that speech in which he talked about those things when he um, forced the US delegation to block consensus on the uh, declaration that would have summed up the Finnish chairmanship and launched the Icelandic chairmanship. It was the first time in the history of the Arctic Council that the uh, council could not agree to such a document and it really did uh, affect the way the organization worked over the next two years, that and of course in the pandemic. And now we uh, move to another transition from Iceland to Russia as the chairmanship, the two-year term shifts hands. Can I get each of your thoughts on what your expectations are with Russia in the driver's seat? Michaela, let's start with you. Yeah, well, the Arctic Council will continue to be a body for consensus and a, a venue for peace, which is one of the things that they really hammered in today at the, uh, at the ministerial. I also hear that they're going to be focusing quite a bit on sustainable development, particularly with um, indigenous peoples in mind across the Arctic. And that's quite an important topic as we see there's a dearth of infrastructure in many parts of the Arctic and social services. And so if the Arctic Council is to focus on sustainable development, then uh, those would be some of the issues that'll be touched upon. 
Evan, you already talked about the structure and the consensus model in a way that suggests that the chairmanship doesn't automatically mean that you essentially have control. Uh, so could you, is there going to be much of a change when we move from Iceland to Russia? Well, I think there will be some change because over time, the chair of the council has taken on a kind of leadership or spokes country role um, that's quite pronounced. And so um, I think the Russians will now be the ones who are leading the communication strategy for uh, the Arctic Council and speaking for it, albeit with hopefully a fair amount of consultation among the Arctic, Arctic states before they say anything of, of substance. Um, I was struck listening to Minister Lavrov uh, this morning that um, he was, I think, saying most of the right things. He was saying that he wanted the Russian chairmanship to be characterized by consultation and cooperation and consensus. Um, he did add, uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, some thoughts on security issues, but I don't think he was suggesting that he wanted to overturn the basic tenet of the council in, 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 it, in it not focusing on uh, military security issues. I think he was expressing a somewhat different sort of idea. So I'm relatively hopeful that um, the, the course that the all eight countries are comfortable with will, will continue in the next two years. David, do you share your colleagues' uh, optimistic thoughts? Uh, generally, yes. Uh, one of the things that Minister Lavrov said today was that we will not let you down. And what he meant was that in chairing the council for the next two years, uh, the other states and the permanent participants can count on, one would hope, even-handed, perhaps even visionary leadership from Russia. Two years from now, Russia will want to point at a series of successes that the council has achieved during its term as chair. And in order to get there, it will need the cooperation of the other seven and of the permanent participants as well. So while they do have some influence, as Evan was saying, or we're setting the agenda and being a, a spokesperson for the Arctic or the Arctic Council at least, uh, the council still operates by consensus and the full agenda that all of the participants want is the one that Russia will need to follow. And Russia certainly has an iron in the fire, right? With 65% of the Russian territory, I believe it is on permafrost in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. Indeed, uh, Minister Lavrov mentioned more than once that Russia was the largest Arctic country, and he's right, it is. So before we wrap, I, I want to do this. It's a question I learned in a, in a film school class from a 60 Minutes producer. When you're talking to experts who know infinitely more about the subject than you'll ever know as a generalist, ask an open-ended question that essentially lets you set the agenda versus me. So my question is, what else do people need to know uh, in terms of the just completed meetings or looking ahead uh, for the next 25 years of the Arctic Council? What are things we haven't talked about yet? Michaela, let's begin with you. I think one issue that'll come up, there was a bit of a tense moment, I suppose, during the ministerial where the Inuit Circumpolar Council representative was giving his speech and really said that the state of the Arctic Council now is not is one that kind of troubles um, them. And that's because meaningful engagement is a really important issue. We have, we have consensus, we have six permanent participant organizations sitting at the table. And that's revolutionary in itself, maybe revolutionary is the right term, but that's innovative in itself. Um, but what is the point of meaningful engagement if, for example, someone says something around the table and other people don't listen, right? When you come to consensus, you have to be able to listen to the permanent participants. You also need to be able to have the adequate funding, not only to travel to meetings, but to be able to prepare for meetings and have operational budgets. And so um, when we're looking at the Arctic Council, it is a very innovative, very important framework, but there are still ways that it can be improved, especially with regards to meaningful engagement. Thanks, Evan. So um, I, I think that what Michaela has just said uh, points to the fact that despite the fact that the organization is a success and there's a great deal of, of uh, good feeling uh, among the participants, there are also lots of tensions and uh, political issues, including um, within the various Arctic states that play out on, on this stage. And so there are areas where uh, it seems to me the, the Arctic Council has not yet made sufficient progress, 
Um, and one of those is related to uh, marine management, for example. Um, there were the materials that uh, released the new strategic plan are relatively light uh, in general on the kind of progress that has to be made there. And so there's an awful lot of work to be done. It's not a US Russia type of issue necessarily, but there are uh, coming changes in the Arctic that the, the Arctic states are going to need to, um, to grapple with um, that, that will take a fair amount of time. Thanks. David, you get the final word. I have two thoughts. One has to do with our fellow Americans. Uh, while Michaela, growing up in Anchorage, probably had a sense of the Arctic uh, sort of uh, bred into her, uh, for many Americans, it still remains a remote, uh, distant, largely unknown space. If you live in Miami, if you live in Topeka, if you live in Houston, you need to become aware that the Arctic matters to you as well. And those of us involved in Arctic policy need to be better at explaining why that is true. Hopefully events like today's uh, can help do that. The second point picks up on something that Evan said. The Arctic Council is the centerpiece of um, a kind of international architecture we have built for governing the Arctic region. Uh, but will it be adequate 25 years from now or even 10 years from now? And I tend to think the answer is no. I think we will need something more to deal with the burgeoning issues in the Arctic that are coming our way. Thank you. Thanks to all of you, Michaela Stith, Evan Bloom, David Balton. And I should put a plug in for the Polar Institute because uh, as David suggested, if you're not interested in the Arctic now, you ought to be. And a great resource for that is our Polar Institute. If you come to wilsoncenter.org and click on the uh, this topics, topics tab, you'll be able to find content from our three guests and plenty more. We hope you'll do so. And we hope you'll join us again for another episode of Wilson Center Now and that you enjoyed this one. Until then, for all of us at the center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.